So once again, I'd like to thank everyone uh, on behalf of the Columbus KTC for your support over the years. Our new center is now open and we're very excited to, uh, to be having programs there now due in part to your generosity. So thanks very much for that. And, uh, and to, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a topic that I think uh, we all need. And that topic is um, how, to, how, to, how to be in the current moment uh, that we're going through here. Um, the, the current moment we're going through is, uh, is obviously an incredibly painful moment with so much violence in the world, warfare, pandemic, um, people being cruel to each other, uh, shootings in the United States, taking the life of innocent people and uh, lives being ruined uh, right and left by everything that's going on. And, um, and so uh, I, I kind of wanted to have some space for us to be together today to talk about how we're doing. And then uh, after we have some time to talk about how we're doing, we'll talk about um, some of the things that have helped me personally during this time, and I hope might be of help to you that are based on the teachings of, um, of, of the Buddha's Dharma or the Buddha's teaching. And maybe these things, maybe we'll be able to help each other today. Uh, that's my hope. So um, uh, first things first, um, let's uh, pause for a moment here at the beginning and hold a mind of, um, of goodness. I'm going to be muting microphones um, and just hold a mind of goodness uh, for our get together today and think that you dedicate this session to um, the relief of suffering for yourself and all beings. So we'll sit quietly for just a moment, holding that thought in our mind. Thank you. Um, as um, I'm a Buddhist and I come from uh, a Buddhist tradition, I'm going to start with a short chant uh, in the Tibetan language. Uh, the chant, the words of the chant will be, uh, be spoken in English after it's recited in Tibetan. So you can get a bit of the meaning. The meaning, well, I'll do the meaning first. It's the taking of refuge and the engendering of the Bodhisattva motivation. From now until enlightenment is reached, we take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Through the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may we attain Buddhahood for the sake of all that lives. Now in Tibetan. Sonje chu dan so chi chu naham la. Jang chu pardu tani kyap su chi. Da ji chen so ji pe sunam ki. Dro la pen shir sanje dro par And um, now uh, the four immeasurables in English. May all beings be happy and have the causes of happiness. May they be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they have that great happiness, which is freedom from suffering. May they dwell in great equanimity, free of attachment and aversion to those near and far. Semchen tamche dewa tan de wek yu tan de pag yer che, dunga tan, dunga vi chu tan drawa jer che, dunya me be tewa daba tan min drawa jer che, ne rin chantan yi tan drawa tan yen chen pola, ne pag jer che. And then finally, a prayer to the masters of the lineage to be present with us. Dear masters, please be present with us today, sitting on the crowns of our heads on a lotus and moon seat, 
may we come to know the, the purity and truth of your body, speech, and mind. Oh, Palden Sawela Marimboche, Tagi Chi War Pede Ten Shala, Cadron Jembo Corneche Sunte, Kusun Tugging a Hutrup Sal to So. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the beginning now uh, completed. Let's uh, talk a little bit about how we're doing. <laughs> Um, I'll be interested in knowing if anybody would like to share um, a little bit. Uh, you can say your uh, first name uh, and, uh, and just say something you want to learn today and to make sure that we talk about today. You can talk about what's on your mind and we'll take uh, several uh, comments and this will help us uh, guide the presentation. Anybody have something they'd like to share about how they're doing? or what they would like to hear today. Yes, go ahead. Um, I'd like to uh, learn how to let go of anger. The past couple of years, I worked on a COVID unit and I got sick and um, I don't want that to be my story. I try to use gratitude, but uh, it's so easy to fall back into anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, John, I really do appreciate this because um, uh, I, I know that no one is going to know what you went through. I mean, no one that I mean, I have to begin by saying that no one I have a friend who works at um, um, I don't know whether uh, I think the top level of trauma center is a level three. Yes. Yeah, I have a friend who has worked um, the entire pandemic in a level three uh, trauma hospital, and she's a, a chaplain there and it has uh, it, and even for her as a chaplain, it's been brutal. So it, it's uh, so thank you for being there. And I'm so sorry that it's been so hard. You know, I'm just just want you to know. But we'll do what we can to talk about that today. I think that's a good thing to share. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Other things that people would like to share or make sure they hear today. Because we're here for each other today. Yes. Uh-huh. I see a hand, Elizabeth. Oh, I'm sorry, you will have to unmute, I, I apologize. <laughs> sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, I'm, yes, I'm. Uh, it's interesting that John brought up the anger because that's exactly what's on my mind. But for me right now, it's focused more about um, the shootings Mm -hmm. And I am I am just so angry that that there are people who feel we have to have assault rifles on the streets when children, you know, children and innocent people are dying. Mm -hmm. So I, I need anger addressed, too. Thank you for sharing that. I think uh, you're, you're speaking for so many uh, who are feeling that right now. There's quite a, there's quite a lot. There's quite a lot to to take in, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Other people want to have something, uh, Candy, and then uh, uh, Christy yes. after that. Yes, I'd like to um, have it addressed, you know, sometime in these next two days, um, the deep sadness, uh, that tends to be my thing. And my heart aching and my stomach tight with fear. Um, and also maybe it's sometime during these two days um, and, I, and I'm trying very much to work with being grateful because I have so many things to be grateful for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the middle of the night at four o'clock mm. when I wake up mm -hmm. and I can't get back to sleep and, and I practice mantras and breathing and uh, just about every wonderful thing there is to do. But um, maybe you have a, a, mm -hmm. a tip for that that I haven't tried yet so I could sleep. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing this up. I, I'm so happy that you guys are here and that you're sharing like this, because I, I do think that it's it, it, it's always a good time for Dharma, but especially it seems so in the last week or two, it's just been it's been building up. I see that uh, Leona May has a comment and then Christy will will take yours. Leona May is uh, talking about keeping mentally and emotionally and spiritually safe. Yeah. Uh, and staying useful. Uh, while being surrounded by fear of all kinds. 
It uh, feels like trying to stay dry while swimming. Oh man, okay, I, I get it, I get it. Because there's a, uh, we've lost a lot of our feeling of personal safety in the last three years. And um, uh, you don't know what you have and how valuable it is to you until you don't have it anymore. And this, and the, the sudden change uh, in this, in the world that happened uh, two years ago, it's, it's, uh, it's still with us and we're trying to, we're trying to cope. So I appreciate you sharing that, Leona May, and we'll see if we can find, uh, find some thoughts about that together. And, um, but especially, I really appreciate what you had to say about being useful, because I think that for a lot of us, um, our identity is wrapped up in being something to someone, you know, we're a parent or a child or uh, a sibling or a helper. And so these um, self-identifications, um, they're both useful, <laughs> being useful is useful, uh, but they can also cause some uh, some stress and um, uh, friction inside. So thank you for sharing that. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, Leona, may you have your hand up? Could I, yeah, could I just add to uh, your comments? Made me think of um, I'm I really refrain from listening to news and getting into conversations about things when it feels like all it's going to do is overwhelm me, and then we're just all going to be overwhelmed. If I can just stay a couple steps out of it, then I stand a chance of being useful. So I have, I get criticized for not being up on what's happening in the world or whatever, but more information would decrease my ability to be present for people. I understand. So it's right. a constant, I've, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a push it's, pull. Yeah, it's something, yeah. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Uh, before I get to Ani's, uh, let's um, uh, let's uh, ask uh, uh, Christy, uh, and then after Christy, there'll be uh, uh, Ani, and then after Ani, it'll be Sydney. Okay, uh, Christy. Yeah. So mine I have similarities with others who've already spoken, but uh, I would like to work with the tendency to want to just withdraw mm -hmm. and and kind of um, avoid all that's happening the problems just seem so complex that that it seems hard to find a way to be useful and and even that some things that you might attempt could actually make things worse it's just so hard to to understand what is helpful right now that it my tendency is to want to just stay home and read british mysteries yeah i can you know i can uh... I can relate. Um, I remember um, reading a commentator who said that part of the reason that we that we like mystery stories is because um, generally goodness triumphs in the end. It starts with a paradise that is lost and then restored. And I, I feel that this is part of the reason that this type of literature is uh, popular right now. And it has always been popular for the reason that it is about a, a losing a paradise and then having that paradise restored. Um, okay, uh, it'll be Ani, Sydney, and then Janet. Ani? Sorry, I, uh, I, I think I uh, sent you a little chat. Oh, yes, uh, it, 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 yes I see it now. Okay, I can. I can verbalize if you want how to strengthen and engender faith, not understanding, but faith in mm -hmm. the Dharma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. There's so much uh, that is true about Dharma uh, that we can see demonstrated in our lives, but there, uh, you, we can always use more. We can always, we can always use more, especially when we need that inspiration, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Thank yes. you for that. Thank you, Ani. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for uh, being here and teaching us. Thank yeah, it, it, it's, it just so happens that it seems to have come at the right time. So thank you uh, to uh, uh, Christy for, uh, and the entire group in Solana Beach for being a little bit of prescient there and letting us know we were going to need each other today. Um, let's uh, take Sydney and then Janet. Hi, Lama Kathy. Yes, uh, hi. Could you address uh, 
not having the energy to try to be useful because I find myself being mm. very apathetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I open my phone now and I just read the headline and then I go to the next headline and I just delete, delete, delete. Mm -hmm. And I used to be much more involved and I find myself more uh, feeling hopeless and helpless now. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the pandemic. It's everything. It's every category of life, it seems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, because I think that uh, I really appreciate you sharing this because it's another shade of what Leona May was talking about, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know, where, where we, we want to be connected, but we want to be connected in a way that's healthy for us and doesn't overwhelm us. And that uh, um, disengagement seems to be a, a, a safety mechanism, but it, but what's it's, do we, how does that, does that help us in the long run? And if so, yeah, I understand. That's a, everything is painted with fear and it, it's so I just burrow. <laughs> I get it. I get yeah. it. Yeah. That, I'm yeah. Thank you for, thanks for sharing about that. Cause it is, it is a, it is a shade of humanity right now. It's yeah. what we're, what we're working with. So thank you for that, Sydney. Thank you, Lama Kathy. Yeah. Um, let's see. We have Janet. Mine's uh, kind of on the lines of usefulness. Also, uh, I have been paying a lot of attention to what's been happening, and I feel like I want to do more. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm on my own now. I got divorced, and I I know things that I I I should on myself a lot because I. I feel like I'm not being productive in yeah. a way in creating the curriculum that I need to for high school students that will help them yeah. feel better about themselves. Right. And, but yet, you know, I'm, I watch the videos and, you know, then I get down and then mm -hmm. I, I, all these other things, my sister has cancer and I go visit her. So it's always like, um i should be doing my work and then i inspire myself to say no be in the present moment if you're watching tv about these children practice tong lin mm -hmm. so then i think i am serving because compassion is what's needed right now mm -hmm. and then I, as soon as i'm done with that thought then i feel guilty again that i'm not being productive yeah, I understand. You know, um, there's something that I talk about from time to time in my Dharma talks that uh, I call it uh, our personal style of confusion. Um, and that um, and that we all have um, our own personal style of confusion, which is we we don't know what to do in situations. And so sometimes we fall back on behaviors from the past to help us cope. Uh, but those interesting behaviors from the past are, necess are not necessarily healthy. And, uh, you know, whether, whether it's uh, disconnecting and burrowing, which is what Sydney was talking about, or, uh, or shoulding, I, 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 by the way, I do have to thank the recovery tradition of the 12 steps for the word should, S-H-O-U-L-D, shoulding mm -hmm. on oneself. I think yeah. that, thank you for that. And, um, and then the, whether we're talking about personal safety, uh, fear, uh, the, the wish to be connected, all of these methods of coping that have worked for us in the past, I'm sorry, I said worked, not worked for us in the past, we often bring into our uh, Dharma practice and our spiritual practice. And we bring the unhealthy style of confusion, thinking, oh, if I just do this, everything will work out, or oh, if I just do this, or if I am this, or if I act this, or if I, if I am this, if I'm, can I just be better somehow? If I could just do that, then everything would be fine. But of course, the fact of the matter is that is a style of confusion. It didn't work in the past, and it's not going to work in spiritual life either. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to establish healthy habits of spiritual cultivation, right? healthy habits of spiritual cultivation in the midst of an extremely stressful and an extremely difficult situation that we're in right now. So I appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Let's see, um, we've got time for a couple more and then we'll have to uh, start moving into the presentation. I, I wanna make sure I didn't miss somebody who had their hand up. 
is there somebody else who has a, okay, yeah, Marianne. Thank you, Marianne. I'm sorry, I actually wrote it in the comments. Oh, bless your heart. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> How to find the sweet spot between empathy and compassion for all the suffering and acceptance of the intense karma of these horrifically violent events. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, we have to, you know, uh, paradox is um, kind of a human situation, isn't it? Sure. Um, is. Humans, we humans, because we have this intellect, this brain that can take in and contextualize everything, we have to live with the concepts of that that are in that appear to be in conflict. And you know, uh, we uh, because how can we both feel? Um, this empathy and compassion, and yet at the same time, understand the karma of the, the situation. And uh, there, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, well, uh, I'm going to present a nuanced, uh, my, my presentation on karma is a bit nuanced because my, my uh, teacher, Kempo Carter Rinpoche, uh, held and possessed and uh, spoke about an extremely nuanced uh, situation, a, a teaching on karma, in which all these things can be true at the same time. It can be true that uh, some of the people who have died in these horrific uh, incidents um, had no, um, in, there was no karma for them to be killed. Um, and, uh, and it's, but, but it did come to pass for them. And uh, there is also the situation that some did have the karma to die. But they're not, it's not um, that they, um, there's a way to hold all of that in your heart with love and to, to see everyone as being um, a Buddha in the making who is suffering in one way or another, and that we as their helpers in this world can bring them along while at the same time not allowing ourselves to fall into the well of fear or hatred. And I think that's the, the danger for us right now is that we can see the nuance in these situations and we might prefer to have uh, an either or. We might prefer to have uh, all or nothing approach, but there's, it's actually, it's not black or white, it's shades of gray. And so we have to be able to live with that also. So. I, I definitely appreciate your thoughts about that. And I'll see, I'll see what we can, we'll see, we'll see what we can put together together as we do this. If possible, at one point, um, if you could maybe put in the comments, uh, direct me to that teaching of Kempo Karta Rinpoche, I would yeah. really appreciate that. Um, I, I may or may not be able to do that because uh, it okay. was an oral, it was an oral teaching uh, gotcha. given during the three-year retreat. Uh, the first three-year retreat where we don't have complete transcripts, but um, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, recreate um, his explanations, uh, and then we'll have a recording of that. Fair enough. I have great uh, faith in your ability to do that. Thank you. Uh, and, and in addition, there is a book that I will recommend, uh, Trollic Rinpoche's book on karma, uh, which also presents this exact same nuanced approach. So Thank you so much. Yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll definitely talk about that. And uh, because of time, I'm going to uh, bring this to a close, but I do see Julie, um, Julie has written. Thank you to everyone for sharing today. Uh, oh, and thank you for making this supportive uh, place available. Feeling grateful and like to offer lots of love and positivity to everyone. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you so much for being here. My, she says, my perspective today is that I was just uh, sort of expelled from a horrible work experience as a home health nurse. It was a very scary, challenging experience for me that did take me away from even the comfort of my home. I appreciate challenges like this. I wanted to go and help in a place where I was really needed in a contract that ended almost nine weeks earlier than agreed to. A home health company used me for what they needed, did not pay me for all the hours I worked, while constantly telling me I was doing nothing right. Then once they were able to get a grasp on their situation, they discontinued me due to low census 
meaning uh, service numbers, but lied about it, attacking my character. It was the strangest thing. Anyway, I appreciate being here uh, uh, very much with uh, all of you. I'm so sorry you, you went through that. We all know that, that the uh, healthcare industry right now, based on what I, we've already heard today, has been just a horrific experience for so many people. And then you put on top of that um, folks who don't get treated well by companies that are um, uh, that are, aren't aren't treating people properly, and then you get all of that, and then you know you have a you have a situation in which everybody is suffering in some way because of this. So I'm sorry you went through that, and um, I'm sure that there are pragmatic things that you can do. Uh, for uh, for your uh, for your work in nursing uh, to um, protect yourself from companies like this in the future, um, and I just hope that the, that that kind of experience doesn't happen to you or to anyone in the future. Uh, so, but we'll but we'll definitely talk about feelings here. <laughs> so, yeah, and then um, uh, Linda is asking, would you give some recommendations as how one can pray? for the individuals who have died and are now in the Bardo? And uh, the answer to that is yes. Yeah, we can talk about that. Okay. Well, it's a, it's a lot. So what we might be able to do in uh, this session uh, and the next three sessions, this one and the three that follow it, uh, we're gonna, make, a, we're gonna tr make an attempt to address as many of these concerns as we possibly can. Uh, and um, while at the same time, maybe doing uh, some one minute meditations, because um, my, my thinking is that uh, a particular style of presentation that might be useful for us would be some chat interspersed with um, a minute or two minutes of meditation, and then some questions, and then uh, more um, uh, teaching and sitting and so on. And uh, okay, oh, uh, thank you very much, Leona May. She's um, uh, she's put in a direct message, and I will put it in the chat. Uh, the um, uh, the book that was suggested. Yeah, I'm, I was going to get it out, but now that you've given me, the, I can I can put it in the chat to everyone. I wanted to make sure I had it right. Yeah, there we go. Uh, let's see if it worked. I tried to put it into. Yeah, it looks like it's just not it's not happening. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with everyone, it's the um, it's the Karma book um, by Trollek Rinpoche. Karma, um, what it is, uh, what it isn't, and why it matters. It, it is. Uh, it's not a book to read quickly. It is uh, definitely not a book to read quickly. You'll read a little bit of it, then you'll have to sit with it for a bit. Read a little bit and then sit with it, read a little bit and then sit with it. Uh, but uh, it's a very short book. And Trollek, uh, T-R-L-E-G, Trollek Rinpoche, uh, who has now since uh, passed away, uh, he was just such a gifted teacher. And uh, he, was, um, uh, he was one of many students of Kempo Karta Rinpoche. Uh, and um, and he understands and is able to articulate many of Kemperbache's more nuanced teachings. Uh, so uh, and he also has great great experience as a meditation master and teacher. And uh, so uh, you, uh, the the book is not easy to to, to read, but um, I'm I'm going through it. I'm now going through it for the second time, and I'm seeing stuff that I didn't see before. I do hope to lead uh, a. a um, a book club on this uh, sometime in late summer or early fall. And we'll do eight weeks on the book. Um, I'm doing an eight week course starting in July for KTD on the Great Path of Awakening, which many of you know this is my, is my jam. It's my favorite book ever. And I'll be teaching on that this summer for KTD Monastery. And then I'll be teaching on this book, the Karma book uh, in the fall for Columbus KTC, so there you go. All right. Okay, so um, I, think, I think you can see uh, what we've shared so far today has been the, oh, I'm sorry, I see Marsha. Yes, Marsha. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sort of flat on my back here. 
I just oh, had a blood you. draw. I just had a blood draw when you guys were, oh, <laughs> were talking yeah. about nursing. But um, at any rate, my question is, will when you do the great path of awakening, will it be virtual? Uh, yes, it will be. We're going to do it through Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Because I would love, I've yet to really get through that book. And I'd love to do that with you because I know you're impassioned. I've so got much. it here. It's great. Okay, Mark, thank you. annotated, dog-eared, falling apart. I remember. <laughs> So yes, uh, it will be, uh, and uh, you can um, uh, you can uh, find out about it. Um, uh, the details I will uh, I will look them up in the in, in the foregoing here, and I will have that for you. Uh, the uh, KTD Monastery uh, in Woodstock, New York, is our home monastery, and um, and so uh, it, the uh, July newsletter. Uh, will be coming out uh, in a day or two, and uh, the information about the programs and so forth will be uh, in that newsletter. Uh, what you might, what we might do here is, let's see if I can. Uh, let's see, here it is. Uh, I will send you this, and you can sign up. I'll put it in chat. I am just having trouble. There we go. Finally, got one to take. Um, this is the link for um, the um, constant contact newsletter of KTD Monastery, and then when the uh, when the when it comes out uh, with the details about that book study about Great Path of Awakening, it's going to come out in the next couple of days. So if you get on the mailing list now, you'll be included on that, and you can sign up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, how to hold a, a, a heart, a good heart in the midst of all of this. It's, as you can see, based on what everybody's talked about today, it's not an easy thing. It, it, these really have been difficult times and we're not even um, in places where there is active warfare going on right now, unless you consider the um, large number of guns in America to be, to put us into a, a danger zone. Uh, but um, it's all of this, uh, this holding of a good heart. Uh, it seems hopeless. It seems like something that's impossible to do. But uh, we are human beings who have intelligence and resilience, and we have the capacity to love. And because we have uh, intelligence and um, resilience and the capacity to love, because we have these qualities, we can train ourselves to be able to meet uh, these challenges, maybe not to completely surpass everything that we encounter, but that we can kind of hold our own in the, the difficult times we're finding ourselves in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we all have what I like to call a personal style of confusion. We have um, erroneous ideas about ourselves. Some of us think that we're the greatest thing and others, others of us think that we're the worst thing. We're the best at being the worst. Um, some of us have habits of um, uh, looking at ourselves competitively and thinking, well, I'm not good enough, or I'm going to, or that person is uh, good. I'm jealous of them. I'm going to compete with them. And maybe sometimes we're even competing with ourselves. So all of these methods that we have developed over the years of coping they're based on confusion. They're based on what the Buddha would call illusion. The, the Buddha, in his um, experience of, of spiritual awakening, he experienced something that we call Buddhahood or enlightenment. And in that experience, he came to understand that his mind, the mind that he has, and by extension, the mind we all have, has the capacity for wisdom and goodness and compassion and love. And he taught that all uh, beings have a mind and that that mind can eventually come to know itself and to know itself completely. And in coming to know itself completely be liberated from illusion. And he said uh, among the greatest illusions we have is that, we're, um, that we ha are separate from one another. 
it's not that we're all part of one big mind and he was trying to correct that misunderstanding. No, we are all separate and discrete from one another. That's what the Buddha taught. We all have our own individual minds. But together, we all have the potential to experience the same things, which in this particular case is the mind that can be liberated from illusion. He said that when we experience things in this world, we pretty much instantly think of the things that are, we are experiencing as being separate from ourselves. Um, this is a glass of water and uh, we only relate to it as something that we need, something we want and something we must have. We think that this glass is permanent, real, solid and unchanging. And we feel that way about everything. We feel that way about the trees and the sky and the, the homes that we have and our families. Everything is solid, permanent, real, and unchanging. In other words, we think that everything is unchanging. Everything is permanent. But really, the fact of the matter is, everything is impermanent. Not only is it impermanent, it is interdependent, impermanent and interdependent. So this is why he called our belief in the permanence of everything as being illusory, as being wrongheaded and illusory and um, confusion. Because he said, we treat people and things and situations and even ideas as being solid, permanent, real, and unchanging. And in so doing, we attempt to make the statement that nothing should ever change and nothing can ever change. And we feel that way about everything, including our own personality. Some of us get the idea that our personality is solid, real, permanent, and unchanging when actually it is continuously changing from moment to moment to moment to moment. We are attempting to put reality on something that isn't real. I often use, and you will have heard me use this um, uh, illustration before, we are like the parakeet in the cage looking in the mirror and thinking that there's another bird behind the glass. We interact with our own thoughts, feelings, and emotions, our reflection, as it were. We relate to it as though it was real. And then we either cuddle it because we love it, attack it because we hate it, or we could even be indifferent to it. But we still think that all of the things we experience are separate from our mind and not coming from our mind, that they're sort of coming at us from all directions. And by thinking that things are coming at us for all, from all directions, we become defensive. We want, we, we want those things to stay away from us. Unless of course, there are things that we think of that are going to be helpful. And then we grab those and we want all of those usually for ourselves. And so, because of this basic misunderstanding about the nature of mind, the nature of self, the nature of reality, the external world, we think that everything is solid, real, permanent, and unchanging. We think our self-concept is unchanging. We think the world is unchanging. And because of this, we feel we have to get stuff externally and have stuff and have things and have people and have experiences, or we won't be happy. When, if what the Buddha said was true, if, though, if what he said was true, our mind actually already possesses the potential for well-being. Now, right now, we have the potential for well-being right now. And we have demonstrated this, not just by um, the parakeet in the mirror, but, um, but by having tiny little experiences that show us the holes in permanence and our theories and thoughts about permanence. And the example that I like to give the most is the example of the telephone. And you will have heard this example before. Let's say you're having an argument with someone 
and you are right and they are wrong. You're really pressing your case with them. You are really right and they are really wrong and why can't they see it? And you're in the middle of this argument and your phone rings. And for a moment, you are, you are transfixed because you don't know what to do. Because right now you're in the story of, of being mad at that person because they can't see reason. And yet the phone is ringing, inviting you to a different reality. And so for a moment, you are trans, you don't know what to do. Push your case or answer the phone. Push your case or answer the phone. And then finally you relent and answer the phone and you go, hi, mom, how are you? I've missed you. You know, so we can, we can see that accidentally, accidentally we can find a hole in this belief in the permanence and reality of everything. We can find a hole and the hole is our capacity to instantly change our mind. The phone rings and we become a different person. Because we've done it, even just accidentally like this, the Buddha's teaching is telling us that we can do it consciously on purpose. And this is the function of the practice of mindfulness and meditation, to bring an interruption to confusion as usual. So what meditation allows us to do is it allows us to stop for just a moment the processes of confusion. We can stop the processes of confusion or slow them down just a little bit. And I, I'm going to, is there anybody here who has not learned a form of meditation? Is there, if you could raise your hand, I'd like to see if there's anybody here who has not learned some form of meditation. Okay, it looks like everybody has. So I'm going to go on with that assumption. When we're learning how to meditate, we learn to sit quietly without stimulation coming at us and to place our attention on an object. That object could be um, a flower. I've got some flowers back here. We could use a flower and put that on the table in front of us and place our attention on the flower. Or perhaps we have um, a sound that's happening, like the, out, the, signs, the, the sounds outside our window, bird song or cars going by uh, and so on. I, I know I've made the joke that uh, in California, you have, a ready, uh, you have a ready source of constant sound and that there's a street or a freeway near you and there are cars on it. You know, and so you have this like river of sound that's going by you constantly. Um, so you can place your attention on the sound or you can use uh, the breath and you can place your attention on the breath. Regardless, either way, what you're doing is placing your attention on an object. And that's only the first part of meditation. The second part of meditation is noticing when you're no longer attentive to that object. You notice when you're no longer watching the breath. You notice when you're no longer attending to the sound or the sight. And then you undertake a technique that returns your attention. You notice that you've wandered and you can even label the wandering. You can label it thinking and you can consciously let go of the thought and then consciously return your attention to the object for uh, what one teacher called a fresh start. It's almost like you're starting fresh with your attention. And what I wanna call your attention to at this moment is that returning. When you notice, label, drop and return. I encourage people when they're noticing, dropping and returning, I'm, uh, these days I'm emphasizing something that I didn't use to emphasize, which is gentleness. Um, I've heard meditation teachers talk about this moment. And uh, the, the, one, the, the ones that inspire me the most are the ones who say, when you notice that you've wandered, let go and return, but do it with a sense of gentleness and caring for yourself. Don't just say, oh, you're a bad meditator. Oh, you know, 
bad meditator, come back to the breath or don't be so silly or don't be so stupid or don't be, don't be, don't be, don't be, don't be you know. So the idea is to try to consciously in, inject some gentleness into that process because that gentleness is actually going to help you with any change you want to make in your mind because when we're busy judging ourselves we're not seeing things as they are because remember what the buddha said was and pema chodron quotes this in her book start where you are the first sentence in the book is, we already have everything we need. We already have everything we need and that we have this mind that can know itself and know its true nature and see through the illusion and confusion of permanence uh, and, uh, and separateness into the truth of interdependence and impermanence. We have the capacity to do that and in doing that, wake up from the causes of a lot of our suffering, which come from clinging and fixation, trying to think that everything is permanent, real and unchanging. And so if we can bring that gentleness, we can more easily see that we already have what we need and that we just need to gently remind ourselves and bring ourselves back over and over and over again, because we wouldn't be cruel to a child who misunderstands something. So why would we be cruel to the child of our own mind, the child that is our Buddha nature, the child that is our future awakened self? And so that bringing that gentleness is a way of bringing um, softness to a situation and giving us ourselves the biggest possible chance. And so this is the first point I wanted to make today is that we do have what we need. The techniques of meditation can help us change our mind in an instant purposefully rather than by accident. And that injecting gentleness into the process of noticing and discarding distraction in meditation can actually give us a boost toward being healthy or taking a healthier attitude toward our own confusion and illusion, being kinder to ourselves, and then by definition or by extension, pardon me, being more kind to others. The, does anybody have questions about this, um, about this part? Because I'm, I'm, I'm here for you. Okay, then let's sit quietly for a moment and just allow the mind to rest and practice this a bit. Okay, let's just sit quietly for a moment. Bring our attention to whatever our chosen object of meditation is. I'm going to use the breath and place that attention on the object. And then let's just practice gentleness for a couple of minutes. Practice being gentle when you come back to the object.
Okay, that's a short meditation. Anybody have um, any uh, questions uh, about this process or the ideas that we're talking about? Okay. Okay, just thought I'd check. Um, I think, you know, um, I know that um, uh, John, you and Elizabeth both expressed um, concern about, um, about the feelings of anger um, because it's, um, it's something that we're, we kind of are all going through right now. Um, I think that human beings, this is my opinion, it's, but, and it might just be worth 25 cents, but it's, it's kind of what I, the way I think about people is that human beings are hardwired for justice. And uh, when we see injustice happening, when people treat each other badly, we don't like that. I'm, I've talked before about research, you know, where they, um, they did, uh, they used monkeys or, you know, primates in a, in a, simulation and they they uh paid some of the monkeys in uh in grapes and others weren't paid and eventually the monkeys that were not being paid at a stage they a sit down strike and refused to do any more of the tasks that the experimenters wanted them to do because they wanted their they wanted their grapes uh and so i think uh, human beings are primates also, and we are hardwired for justice. So we don't like it when we see things bad happening to us or to others. And it's very natural for us to then uh, form opinions about others and think that the situation that is happening is going to go on forever and uh, sort of catastrophize, you know, that, our, that things are just going to continue to get bad. And, uh, but here's the situation. In healthcare right now, things really are not getting better, and so um, and so the, there's a there's a feeling that we have about the justified nature of our anger, and that this makes it very hard for us to um, see it as um, as a mental poison that we're taking, but rather that we need anger and we we feel and talk about our confusion and delusion, talk about that, um, that we need to feel anger in order to correct an injustice. And I think we fall into that so many times because um, it's, what, it's kind of what everybody's using right now to motivate people. Be angry at this person, be angry at that person, hate this, be outraged by that. And I think it's because the, uh, the people who are encouraging outrage are doing it um, because they know that they can gain power over people if they, uh, if they can make them angry. Now, you and me, we don't want to be angry, but we feel it because of the injustice that we experience and that we see. And in fact, the, this is such a potent force that it shouldn't surprise us that in the Buddha's, the, the first collection of the Buddha's teachings that were written down, the Dhammapada, uh, that spelled, uh, put it in, I'll put it in the chat. It's um, uh, spelled D H A M M A P A D A, Dhammapada. Um, the, that it's such a potent force that the Buddha actually talks about it in the very first section of this collection of his sayings. He says, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts and with our thoughts, we, we make the world. So he's saying essentially that because our world is a world of experience, that it's a mental world, Yes, there's physicality to it. And yes, there are physical things in our world, but we respond to and experience those physical things with our mind. And therefore, really, um, we, uh, our world is a world of experience. And, um, and so he says this, we are what we think, all that we are arises with our thoughts and with our thoughts, we make the world. So when I was mad at that person in my example of the telephone, you know, 
of the telephone. When I was mad at that person, I was living in the world of me being right and, their, and them being wrong. And then I was really living in that world. And then suddenly the phone rings and invites me to a different world. And I answer the phone and then I'm born in the world of being a child of, this, of the woman who is on the phone with me. And, um, oops, speaking of which, uh, somebody just called me. I love that. So um, in any case, um, in fact, I should silence my phone. I didn't think about that. Okay. Um, but in that moment that we become someone else, it's like we take birth in the world of that thought and that we eventually pass away out of the world of that thought when we go on to the next one. Um, but in any case, the, the Buddha says, um, if we, after saying that we are what we think, he says, if we think or speak or act with an impure mind, by which he means a mind that's self-centered and self-fixated, if we think, speak, or act with an impure mind, suffering follows us just as surely as the um, wheel follows the ox that draws the cart. And then he says, if we think, speak, and act with a pure mind, happiness follows us like a shadow that's unshakable. But then he dives immediately into a scenario of resentment. And he gives a quotation. He's quoting a person who is saying, look how that person beat me and abused me. Look how that person threw me down and robbed me. And then the Buddha says, live with such thoughts and you live in hate. And then he repeats the statement, look how he beat me and abused me. Look how he threw me down and robbed me. And then the Buddha says, abandon such thoughts and live in love. And then he says, hate never once dispelled hate. Only love dispels hate. This is the law, ancient and inexhaustible. Then he concludes this section by saying, you too shall pass away. Knowing this, how can you quarrel? So he's speaking sort of from the high ground of enlightenment while the rest of us are unenlightened and still swimming in these stories of justified anger. And, um, and so, and we're, 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 we're suffering because of this. And, uh, and I, I'm, uh, I, as you can hear, I'm somewhat, I feel some gratitude to the 12 step traditions because uh, my dad was an AA guy who had 26 years sobriety. And I, I did some Al Anon meetings and so forth, uh, but I never worked the steps. However, my dad did. And, uh, and so working the 12 steps really helped to bring him back kind of to himself. And, um, and one of his statements taken directly from the 12-step um, the tradition, they have slogans too. Not, it's not just Buddhist mind training that has slogans. The AA folks have slogans. One of my favorite ones of my dad's was, um, he quoted, he said, nursing a grudge or a resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other guy to die. Because it's true when we when we feed our own angry thoughts and our angry resentments, when we do that, we're actually causing damage to our system. They're now even doing research on the role of cortisol, which is a, a hormone that comes from maintaining an angry state, explaining that cortisol causes uh, blood pressure trouble, it causes diabetes, it causes all kinds of negative impacts in the body. Uh, and so it's to our benefit to learn how to work with our minds when we're feeling that anger. And, uh, and so I, I can, it's almost like self-preservation to take care of ourselves and to, and to try to work with our anger. And boy, I can sure appreciate what what folks shared with us so far, which is how hard it is to do that. How hard it is to work with anger, especially when we feel justified because we're, 
we're angry about an injustice, how we've been treated or how others have been treated. And, um, and, and even in the story of the traveling nurse that we just heard, you know, a traveling nurse's story about how she was uh, hurt by a, a company that was uh, sort of ruthless and how they applied their, uh, their policies. There's this sense of injury and how can we recover from this injury caused by someone else? Well, of course, we can always take people to court if we feel we have a good enough case and the lawyer tells us we could win. We could always do that. But there's also like the peace of mind that we lose by living in the world of injustice where we're the person who's the victim. And so if there's some way that we can reframe what's going on, in a different way, this can help also. Um, I know someone uh, mentioned that karma is, is part of all of this. And, um, and I'm looking at the clock and I'm seeing that we're gonna have to take our, our uh, meal break uh, in about 15 minutes. If you guys are okay, I'd like to go 20, if that's all right. And that'll give me a five extra minutes to do a couple things. Uh, and if you can't stay uh, past the bottom of the hour, um, we'll have a recording you can watch. Um, we, we try our best uh, to work with anger, but one of the things we have to understand about anger is that indulging in it is not, it's not uh, free. It's not like, um, it's, not, it's not a victimless crime. <laughs> Indulging our anger is not a victimless crime because we're the ones who suffer from that. And so if we can, um, the Trong Rupache in one of his teachings said, if we could possibly see anger as not being a friend and seeing anger as a poison and then making a, a promise to ourselves that we will notice our anger and set it aside when possible. I think that's, uh, he says it all begins, all change begins with noticing and understanding the poisonous nature of these mental afflictions and seeing how we damage ourselves by prolonging them. As a friend of mine who's a, a therapist said once, that person only hurt you once, but you relive the hurt over and over again uh, by resenting what happened. And uh, that's a little harsh to hear. I, I, I hate to think that, that I do that myself, but I've done it myself when I felt wronged in situations. What they're trying to say is that we should do things that help our mind, not things that harm our mind. So I think that's the first point is that when we feel that harm coming to our mind, at that moment, we should take action. And, uh, and somebody asked for a little first aid. And uh, so I'm going to share with you a first aid exercise that was given to me by a Tibetan physician. And um, this will be a little first aid for those of us who are feeling fear, who wake up in the middle of the night and feel discomfort, or who are troubled by angry thoughts, um, who, um, fear for their personal safety or feel deep sadness. Um, this this uh, technique was taught to me um, by um, the uh, Akhong Rinpoche and that's spelled uh, A, I'm gonna type it in the chat, A-K-O-N-G, Akhong Rinpoche. He passed away a number of years ago, um, but he was, um, he was not a physician per se, but he practiced uh, a psychology that he called Rokpa, R-O-K-P-A, Rokpa psychology that he created. And the Rokpa still exists today and you can read about it. He wrote a book uh, called Taming the Tiger. And in this book, uh, he talked about making friends with your mind in the midst of difficult feelings. And what he said that you might want to do first when you're having intense, difficult feelings is to slow yourself down first, just to slow everything down. And so he gave a three-part exercise. The first, the first part was breathing. 
The second part was feeling. And then the third part was openness. Part one is breathing. Part two is feeling. Part three is openness. And so in the breathing section, he says, when you're sort of in the grip of difficulty, and he said, even when you're not, you should practice this on a regular basis if you have ever found yourself sort of victimized by or gripped by feelings. He says, you can practice this when you're not experiencing the feelings, but you can also do it when you are. He said, um, begin by taking um, a breath in through your nostrils, if possible, and through your mouth, if you're congested. But you take the breath in deeply to the count of five. You breathe in. And after having breathed in for a count of five, you hold for a count of five. And then you breathe out through the mouth, blowing. Also to a count of five. Breathe in. Hold. Breathe out. And you do this five times. Um, and by doing this kind of breathing, it slows you down a little bit. It physically slows you down. And then uh, you can move into the second phase of the exercise, which is feeling. The breathing slows you down. And then with uh, the feeling exercises to, to um, look at yourself in the, your mind's eye from the become aware of your physical, physical body, starting at the top of your head and then being aware of and thinking about your, your head, face, neck, shoulders, just becoming aware of your body and practicing that awareness as you go down through the, 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 the waist and the hips and the legs and the feet down to the soles of your feet. And he said, as you're practicing this feeling exercise, he said, note any place in your body that's where there's pain or tension. Like maybe you're holding tension in your jaw. Maybe you're holding tension in your chest. Just note it. You don't have to work with it. Just note it, make a note of it. And then he said, come back. Once you're down at the soles of your feet, he said, come back up and note everything a little more quickly. He said, you take your time uh, going down the body, but when you come back up the body, he said, you can go a little more quickly and just notice the areas of stress, pain, and tension. And he says, and once you get back up to the top of your head again, he said, you use your imagination and you imagine that uh, uh, there's a, a, a plug that has come out from the bottom of your foot and that your body's filled with water. So you use your imagination to imagine that your form is filled with water and that suddenly a, a plug has come out and the water is now draining out of your, you know, the imaginary water is draining out of the imaginary you and taking with it all of the stress, the pain and the tension from those various parts of your body and that the stress, pain, and tension go into the ground and uh, nourish the ground beneath you. And, um, and then after this, all of this imaginary water has left with all of the imaginary, now, now imaginary stress and pain and tension, then we can move into the third part of the exercise, which is openness. So you can see how these, how these exercises, they build one upon the other. Slowing down the breathing gives you a little bit of space from what you were thinking and feeling. And then noting stress and tension through the feeling exercise helps you to note where in your body you're feeling these feelings. 
And then of course, the, the second half of the feeling exercise allows you to imagine that imaginary water going out of you with all of that imaginary stress. And then finally, you're ready for the openness exercise. And the openness exercise deals with uh, emotion and feelings you might have. And it, because first you brought your attention to the body with the breath and with the feeling exercise, and now you're going to bring your attention to your mind with your, with your emotions. And, uh, and he said, you feel, you, you feel how you're feeling, you know, maybe you're still angry, maybe you're still sad, maybe you're still upset or fearful. And he said, and for this openness exercise, he says, you imagine an open space in front of you. He said, put an arch or a gate in front of you in space. Just imagine that in front of you, there's this gate in space. And that as you breathe out, you think that all of this difficult emotion, all of your thoughts, feelings, and emotions go out of your body and go through this gate. And on the other side of the gate, they turn into golden light. And that this golden light is the golden light of universal love and compassion. So no matter what you're thinking or feeling, if you're feeling angry, you, you let your anger go through the gate and turn into the golden light of universal love and compassion. If you're feeling sad, you let the sadness go through the gate and become the golden light. If you're uh, fearful, you allow the fear to go out and become golden light. And that this golden light, no matter what it's coming from, your anger or your fear or your sadness, it, it touches you and it helps you. It fills your room. It fills the space you're in. It fills your home. Then it spills out and fills the neighborhood. Then it spills out and fills the city. And then it fills the, the nation and the, and the world and the universe until you have expanded this golden light uh, to, to fill all that appears and exists and everything you can imagine. And then you let go of the visualization and let your mind rest. Just in a moment of silent, empty space. And this type of exercise he recommended uh, that people do uh, regularly until they get the hang of it. Uh, you might put it in your uh, regimen of meditation every day. And it will take you five minutes, 10 minutes maybe at the max to do this exercise, but it will then be there for you if you need it urgently. So um, um, I think we're going to do it. It'll, we, I think I can do it in five minutes and then do five minutes of feedback. So uh, see if anybody has uh, feedback. So let's um, sit quietly and uh, I'll, I'll walk you through it. Apologies, by the way, for how fast this is going to go. Um, I'm only going to do the, the breathing for a three times around, for example. So, okay, let's start by the sitting and just feeling our body and just sitting quietly. Then we're going to practice the breathing, breathing in for a count of five. Holding, breathing out, breathing in, holding, breathing out, one more time, breathing in. Holding, breathing out, and now just allowing the breath to be natural.
Now we'll move into the feeling exercise. Starting at the top of our head, we think about the top of our head and then uh, you can close your eyes for this if that's helpful. And then just uh, note the feelings in your body, starting at the top of your head, working down through the face, the jaw, the neck, the shoulders, noting any places where you might be feeling stress or tension. Moving down through the torso, to the seat, through the back, to the seat, and then into the legs. Past the knees, into the ankles and the feet. Pausing and then working back up from the feet to the ankles and knees. Up through the, the seat, into the waist, up the back and front of the torso. Again, noting places of tension or pain. Through the shoulders, neck, face top of the head, now imagining that the body is filled with water and the plug at the bottom of your foot comes out and all of the water and the stress and tension drain out into the earth. The water then having drained out, we turn our attention to our thoughts and feelings. We make note of how we are feeling. And we imagine that in front of us in space is a gate. It can be any kind of gate stone, iron, gold, doesn't matter. <laughs> and then as we breathe out, we think that all of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions, even if we can't identify them, all of them go out from us with our breath through the gate and then turn into the golden light of universal love and compassion. With every out breath, our emotions and thoughts and feelings go out and through the gate. Some people tell me that it's easier just to see the thoughts, feelings, and emotions flowing without connecting it to the breath. That seems okay too. The golden light fills the room you're in, touching you and benefiting you and helping you. Then the golden light continues to flow out to your home and everyone in it. The neighborhood. The city, the region,
And this golden light is benefiting everyone it touches. People who are in pain are benefited. Criminals are benefited. Those who suffer are benefited. And finally, the love and compassion, the golden light fills the entire universe. The meditation concludes by allowing the visualization to fade away, disappear. And letting the mind rest. Okay, that's a little bit of spiritual first aid. Any, uh, any questions about the process? Pretty straightforward. Well, then maybe this is a good time for us to take our break. What do you think? Okay, with the break. All right. Um, yeah. Um, let me see if I can remember. We're going to begin again at, it's 2.30 here. Uh, so it's probably what, 11.30 with where you are? Okay, so 90 minutes would be one o'clock um, Pacific time, two mountain, three central and four Eastern. So I think that's what we're gonna do, okay? I know it's a bit of a long break, but uh, this will give you a chance to get a, uh, get some food and maybe get a little rest. And then we'll uh, then we'll start um, uh, the what I'm going to do is I the, the I will close the uh, the recording for now and uh, close the Zoom stream, but I'll reopen it again at about ten minutes to uh, one Pacific and four Eastern. And then we'll see you back. It's exactly the same Zoom stream, so it'll all be good, okay? We dedicate the merit of this morning's session to all, uh, ses all sentient beings and make the aspiration that everyone is free from suffering and comes to that heart of goodness that we're looking for. Okay, everyone, I'm going to pause the recording. <laughs>